Hello and welcome to today's live Facebook streaming service and YouTube streaming service. We're so happy that you have joined us today. I am Jamie Rohrbaugh and this is... Michael Itson. Nice to be here. And Michael is our Director of Operations. Sure, yeah. We tease him and call him all manner of other titles, Senior Vice Ooh. President of this and that, you know, depending on the day. He makes everything <laughs> run here at our this ministry from his presence. And I am Jamie Horba. Um, I am the founder of From His Presence. And today we have a very important message we'll be teaching on today. And um, Michael's going to help me get through this teaching and ask ask questions that I should be remembering to answer and, okay. and chime in uh, as much as he wants to. But we are teaching today, and we're going to go ahead and get started without... Um, we're going to have mu our music playing in the background, but we're not going to specifically start with um, with music and, and singing right now because I have such a burden that um, I believe is from the Lord, a burden with the Word of God right now that is like a fire burning in my bones. And it's about freedom, it's about inner healing, and it's about deliverance. And this week, um, I finished writing a book, an e-book for you that is releasing on Monday. And the, the ebook, I'll just show you the black and white cover that I printed. Um, I didn't want to use colored ink when I printed it, but it's um, the cover, black and white version, looks like this. And it's called Labyrinth. And it's Labyrinth and How to Escape It. And it's a seven step process for getting free from abuse, control, manipulation, and accusations and the people who inflict them. Now, that's a pretty hard hitting title, a pretty hard hitting topic. And, um, but we are going to talk about some pretty hard-hitting scriptures today. So we've already been praying, but I want to pray right now over you before we dig into the word. And then we're going to jump because I really believe that the Lord is going to help us right now to show you these scriptures. And the Lord personally is going to set you free today. Remember, Jesus said, he whom the Son sets free is free, free indeed. indeed. Yeah. yeah, he is the, Jesus is the ultimate freedom agent. The truth yes. shall set you free. That's right. That's the other thing he said. You will know the truth. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. So, and remember that Jesus also said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the life. Yeah. There's no part of Jesus that is falsehood at all. That's right. There's, it's just 100% truth. So, if we are going to be seekers of Jesus, pursuers of Jesus, mm -hmm. copycats and imitators of Jesus, what do we also have to abide in? The truth. The truth. Yeah. 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 And, and so this the is the opposite of that are lies. Absolutely. And who is the father of lies? That's what Jesus said. The father of lies is the devil. And That's in right. fact that there's no truth in him. That means everything he says is a lie. Right. Yep. If he's moving his lips, it's a lie. There you go. But Jesus, if he's moving his lips, it's the truth and it's going to make you free. And so we're going to pray. Let's do that. And then we're going to dig into God's word about freedom for you today. Father, in Jesus' name, we plead the blood of Jesus. We take authority over this recording. We command all of the equipment to work, the broadcast to work perfectly. Lord, we say your word will run swiftly. Lord, that we will speak and teach and pray as the oracles of God. And we ask, Father, that you would let your word just well up out of us like a fire in our bones and come forth that you would teach your own word through us father and that every person who is watching right now and every person who will yes. even watch and listen later every person would be made free by your blood jesus by your word by the word of their testimony god by the blood of the lamb and we thank you father we thank you for jesus who makes us free and jesus we just plead your blood over everything that we're about to talk about and over the minds and the soul the body and the spirit of the hearers and over us as well. And we thank you, God. Be glorified in this word. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So I already mentioned that we're talking right now about the seven-step process. And that seven-step process, we, we may have to mention several times. Michael, could you read that um, description of what it is people can get free from based on this teaching? Absolutely. And for those that are just tuning in, this is going to be released as an ebook mm -hmm. on Monday. Yes. So we've been stepping that each day, kind of getting you guys prepared. It's right. A, you sent me the, the cool graphic. I said, oh, that's great. It's like you're trapped in a maze. You're trapped, and now we're going to escape. So it says how to escape this. So yeah. the seven step process for getting free from abuse, yep. control, manipulation, accusations. And 
the people who inflict them. Yeah. And we always want to remember that we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Right. Um, the Bible says we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and rulers of this present darkness. Mm -hmm. And that means that people are not our enemy. That's right. So when you're in a situation where somebody is abusing you, controlling you, manipulating you, accusing you, and so on, we could probably add lots of different actions and labels mm -hmm. in that series, and they would all fit. When you're in that situation, we do need to remember, and the first thing is to remember, that that person is not our enemy. The enemy, the devil, is our enemy. It sure feels like they are, though, sometimes. It can. You know, it sure does on the flesh. It sure it does. It sure can. But we, al we also can notice, okay... I'm going to keep my heart pure with love for them, but because these people allow the enemy, the devil, to work through them, then I am going to distance myself from that based on the Word of God. Yeah. Because we're not to have any fellowship with darkness. No. So, uh, let's start. We're, um, sorry. Here, if you, You're good. I'm sorry. We've got so many notes here, that, um, and, and only two music stands. We probably need like a eight-foot... You're good. Um, pulpit here to teach everything from, but we're going to get started, and I may not hit every point that's in the ebook, but again, I may go deeper in some ways. Mm -hmm. I don't know. We're just going to follow the leading of Holy Spirit here yeah. and teach the Word. So the first thing I want you to know is that this is not just like a teaching. It's not just an ebook that we're releasing for the sake of releasing an ebook. This is a freedom guide where we are showing you the scriptures, and if you are a Christ follower, then you believe that the scriptures are inerrant and infallible because the word became flesh and dwelt among us. Mm -hmm. That's right. The word of God is Jesus, and Jesus is the word of God. Mm -hmm. And it says in the Psalms that God has magnified his word above all his names. Mm -hmm. I mean, that is pretty serious significance that God shows us right. he gives to his word. So this is a freedom guide where if we obey the word, you will find yourself on the path and walking out on the path to freedom and walking out your freedom, okay? And I also want you to know when we start this that it is important for people to understand that honesty is the beginning, that Jesus is the truth. Yeah. We started talking about that not because we just needed something to talk about, but in order to get free from any situation, no matter what that is, maybe it's um, you know a health condition that you could reverse, but you have to admit first that you have that health condition. Right, sure. You know, maybe you're having heart trouble and the doctor says, you need to walk every day. Mm -hmm. But if you're like, no, there's nothing wrong with me, then you won't ever take the step that it takes to get freedom. Right. And when I say nothing wrong with me, please don't take that as an insult. I just mean, if you are in a place where you are being abused in a position, in a relationship, in a, you know, maybe it's a marriage, I wish it weren't true, but we get a lot of prayer requests from people in marriages who are being abused. And... Um, if you're in that position, no matter what, the first thing is you must be honest with yourself. Jesus said, you will know the truth and the truth will make you free. And um, there's a popular line out there in Christian teaching that says, well, it's not the truth about someone else that's going to make you free. It's the truth about you. Actually, I would argue with that and say it's the whole and total truth about yourself, about other people, about actions, about relationships, about situations. 100% of your life and every aspect of it should be defined by truth right right yeah so it's the truth about everything you don't have to just look at yourself with some you know like a, a magnifying glass and say oh god what's wrong with me but look at everything else around you with rose colored glasses and say well nothing could possibly be wrong with anything else this must be all my fault and if you do that that's that's not from the lord okay so you have to look at the truth and if you are in a place a situation a relationship where you are being abused you are being manipulated, you are being falsely accused, you are being provoked. The list could go on and on. Michael, where is that list? I'm going to have you re read that list of the seven things that's on the cover over sure, and over. absolutely. Um, if you're in a, a situation where you are being subject to gaslighting, narcissistic attacks, control, what are those, those things right here? Right, abuse, control, manipulation, Accusations. Right. Those are the things. Yep. If you're in that situation, the first step is to say and to admit, I am being abused. I am being controlled. I am being manipulated or whatever your situation is. I am being falsely accused. I am being subject to gaslighting, whatever it is. Okay. Because if you don't start there, if you're just in denial, you're never going to get free and move on to what God has for you. 
Okay, so after that, the, the next key principle, now this is just kind of the introduction, but a key principle that you have to learn is that the scripture says God is not always the one that delivers you. Sometimes God expects you to deliver yourself. Now, some of these scriptures, I promise you, I'm going to back them up with actual scripture, but it's going to fly in the face of what we often believe in Christian culture. Christian culture sometimes says, I can't do anything. I must wait for God to do everything. But God actually says, hey, I'm in you and I'm going to do it through you because remember, without me, you can do nothing. But as you grow up in the Lord, I expect you to learn how to put your shoes on by yourself, learn how to pull up your pants by yourself, learn your, your, your trousers for those of us, or for those in, the, in other countries, that, you know, learn how to, to brush your teeth by yourself. And at, at some point, I expect you to deliver yourself. Now, right. God is going to show you how, right. and he'll be the one in you working through you, right. both to will and to do for his good pleasure. But let's look at Isaiah 52, verses 1 and 2. Okay. Powerful, powerful scripture. This is what it says. Uh, Michael, could you actually read that for us? Absolutely. Thank you. We're reading in the New King James, Isaiah 52, starting in verse 1. Awake, awake. Put on your strength, O Zion. Put on your beautiful garments, O Jerusalem, the holy city. For the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. Shake yourself from the dust. Arise, sit down, O Jerusalem. Loose yourself from the bonds of your neck, O captive daughter of Zion. That is pretty deep. Here's God speaking to his children. And he is saying, not, let me deliver you. No. I mean, he is actually saying, get up, put your shoes on, get dressed, mm -hmm. walk out the door. You know, I say things like that sometimes to my child. Hey, we're getting ready in the mornings, you know, and sometimes he just gets ready. It's no problem. But other times he'd rather pet the dog, you know, play with his toys, do any number of things. Right. You know, <laughs> and I'm like, sometimes I'm just like, put your shoes on right now. Get up, put your shirt on, put your pants on, eat your breakfast. We are leaving right now. You know, well, this is kind of the Lord in that in that position. Sure. He's saying, awake, get up, put on your strength. And of course, he's doing it with kindness and love. But kindness and love doesn't mean you're not firm sometimes. Right. So he's saying, put on your strength. In other words, you have some strength. Mm -hmm. Put on your beautiful garments because you have some. I've made you beautiful. He's basically is what he's insinuating there. You have beautiful garments. Oh, Jerusalem, the holy city for the uncircumcised and the unclean shall no longer come to you. In other words, he is tired of the uncircumcised and the unclean messing with his children. He's blocking them out. He's wanting you to get away from them. And then he says, shake yourself from the dust, arise. He's not saying, let me brush you off. Come here, you fell down. Let me, let me wipe off your jacket. No, he's saying, shake yourself off from the dust. Shake yourself from the dust, arise. In other words, get up. And he's telling you to, us to do it ourselves. Mm -hmm. Sit down, O Jerusalem, loose yourself from the bonds of your neck. In other words, he's clearly saying you have some bonds on yeah, your neck. Absolutely. And that we ourselves are supposed to admit that they're there mm -hmm. and take them off. Take them off, yeah. And then he says, O captive daughter of Zion. He's Meaning clearly captive. describing, yeah. yeah. You are in bondage. You are in chains. Sit down, take the bondage off, and move out. Yeah. Pretty clear stuff. Um, okay, but, but we don't often think of this because often in modern Christianity, we have adopted a namby-pamby, uh, effeminate version of Christianity that forgets that we are have the Lion of Judah living inside of us and we just think of the Lamb of God, that we should be, you know, just so so timid and shy. But actually, Jesus is the guy who goes into the temple, is in anger that God's house is being disrespected, flips over the stuff, the, the tables and the, the merchandise from people who are charging a gouging markup. They, they're using God's people and abusing God's people in a way they shouldn't be doing. He makes the whip with cords. He, he makes it himself. I mean, that must have been a scary scene. I don't, you know, and he's whipping these people and getting them out. And that was holy. Yeah. That was the Lion of Judah. Right. But we are like, oh, Lamb of God. And of course, he is the Lamb of God. But we have to remember that he is all these things and they're all good and righteous and holy. And in the same way, he's in you to be the same. 
not just one aspect of his nature, but all aspects of his nature. And how do we learn those aspects? It's through application and study of every part of the Bible, That's not right. just the part that says love is patient, love is kind. Mm-hmm. You know, one part does not negate the other part. They all work together. Scripture never, ever contradicts itself. And if we think it does, we simply haven't studied the meanings enough to understand. Okay. Mm-hmm. So, so God's, my point here, what I was trying to get to is God's chosen method of deliverance in Isaiah chapter 52 is for you to deliver yourself. Mm-hmm. Are we clear on that? Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, we, we see, like you just mentioned the New Testament. Well, we see even Jesus when, and I don't know if you're going to point to that later, but it, that even that verse makes me think of when he looks at the man and says, do you want to be healed? Well, then get up. Oh, good point. Dust yourself off and yeah. stand up. Yeah. And uh, just, you know, just a thought. Just Thanks. because he's like, well, this man's even lame and he has, he's laying there. Well, he has enough strength to at least get in. Well, I have to have faith to get up. That's a healing demonstration. But still, he asks him, he doesn't lean down and say, let me pick this guy up. Right. And, you know, he says, you stand up, you roll up your mat, let's go. Yeah, and that's deep. I hadn't thought of that, but I believe that guy responded that he'd been laying there for, or 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 maybe the Bible just says it, but I think he'd been laying there 38 years. Okay. And he says, "But I have nobody to put me into the pool," because he was at the pool when the angel would come down and stir the waters. He, but I have nobody. So he's saying, "I can't be delivered. I can't be healed because I have nobody to come and heal me." And you're right. Jesus did tell him, "Just get up." Mm -hmm. Okay, that's deep. Um, Okay, so. Next, um, I want you to know next that we have to stop waiting for God to um, give us my new instructions about everything. It's not that he's not always speaking because he is. His name is the word. He always has something to say. But maybe God wants to talk to you today about how much he loves you, not the fact that you should put your shoes on. If you think about it with your child, how much more fun is it to stand there and talk to your three-year-old and make jokes and make them laugh while they're putting their shoes on independently? You know, relationship and parenting means that he grows in relationship with us as we become able to do certain things by ourselves. And of course, I'm not negating that we can do nothing without Christ. But what I, when I say by ourselves, I mean without having to be told, without having to have him hover over us and say, tie your left shoe, tie your right shoe, put on your right sock, put on your left sock. I mean, but if we think about Christian living, sometimes we wait for God to do that. You know, God, I actually knew someone one time who, who I'm not kidding you, he, he would actually ask God if it was okay for him to go to the restroom and do his business. I'm like, okay. I'm, I'm not kidding you. You can't make this stuff up, okay? Um, and it's like, you look at that, and he, I'm sure that it, to him it must have felt holy. Oh, I'm, I'm just only following the voice. But yet to everyone around us, you can see, well, you know, God gave you a brain, and it's okay for you to use it. Anyway, um, that's just, that's a very exaggerated example, but a true story because, again, can't make it up. Okay. Um, but anyway, so, so if we look at the fact that God does expect us to grow and to learn to do some things for ourselves as he flows through us, working in us both to will and to do for his good pleasure, then that starts to put some responsibility on us rather than responsibility on, well, God, why God, why? When God, when? Why haven't you delivered me yet? You know, why haven't you helped me put my shirt on yet, God? And I I say those kinds of things because I'm the mother of a five-year-old, right? So we're still working on this get dressed by yourself thing because it's much more fun to have mama do it all for us, you know? Oh, sure. (laughs) I know you've got three, so you've been there. Yeah, been there, done that. Eventually, they have to be able to do things on their own. Well, I'm I'm still just believing that, you know, by the time we get to college age. Oh, wow. (laughs) You know, (laughs) uh, we'll be there. But but, um, anyway, so when God delivers you, Sometimes he does it through your delivering yourself and he waits to deliver you until you decide that you're going to obey him and deliver yourself. And then he comes up under you and he helps you deliver yourself because, of course, it's just him working through you. But it is he does expect you to make the decision. Now, here's another scripture. Um, Psalm 68, verse 6. Can you read that one for us, Michael? Absolutely. Psalm 68, verse 6. God sets the solitary in families he brings out those who are bound into prosperity but the rebellious dwell in a dry land 
Mm. So God does bring out those who are bound into prosperity, even while he's telling us to do it himself or to do it ourselves. So it really is him working through us, but it's just a way that he grows us and it helps us to mature. And then also, if you're not sure that that I'm right about this, here's another scripture. There are so many, but I'll just read this one or Michael can. Psalm 34, 14. Yeah, Psalm 34, 14. We've been in the Psalms here. So Psalm 34, 14 says, Depart from evil and do good. Seek peace and pursue it. And I believe that's a command, is it not? It's a command. It doesn't say, I'm going to gently drag you. Yeah, (laughs) he's saying depart from evil. In other words, you have to shake yourself from the dust and arise. As he also said in Isaiah 52, depart from evil. Get up and do it. And do good. Seek peace and pursue it. All right. So this is just the introduction. There's a lot more, but I'm going to keep moving because we're limited time and I want to get into the meat of the seven step deliverance process. Okay. So we're going to just kind of skip over some things and we're going to start with step one. That's a good place to start. Good, good place. Yes. Step one is to examine situational fruit. Okay. Now, Michael, um, I had a question about this from someone who was uh, reading the book here on our staff. Uh, Pastor Dan was reading this, and and I wanted to make it clear. There's a difference between the fruit of the Spirit in you and the fruit of a Spirit in a situation. Okay. So, for example, if you are in an abusive marriage, but you love the Lord and you spend time with the Lord, and so every morning you get up and you pray and you worship the Lord and you read your Bible, you're hiding God's word in his heart and you you pour out your heart to the Lord in prayer and supplication and thanksgiving and you make requests known to God, then 100% of the time, the peace of God, which passes all understanding, is going to guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. And that's the fruit of Holy Spirit in you. But if you're getting beaten every single day by an abusive spouse, now I hope this isn't happening to you, but if you are, just because you have peace, because you love the Lord and you're right with Him, doesn't mean that the th- everything around you is peaceful. So the situation itself might not be bearing fruit, but you can still bear fruit. Why is that important? Well, because the fruit of the Spirit are listed in Galatians 5. Um, could you just read this list right here, Michael, the fruit of the Spirit? Absolutely. So we're in Gal- Galatians 5. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Thank you. Let me first clarify, because people sometimes think long-suffering means to suffer longer. And um, I was I was a little bit unsure about that a number of years ago, so I looked it up at my trusty, rusty Strong's Concordance, because I was like, surely... God can't want us to just suffer longer just for the sake of suffering. I mean, really? And so I looked it up. And um, actually, I was uh, glad that I looked it up because long suffering, I learned in the original Greek, actually means big fierceness. It's like a lion roaring over a situation. Like you're going to bear with it a long time and you're just going to be fierce over a thing. So that is what it means, long suffering. So what is the point here? Well, those things that we just that Michael just read are from the Lord. Okay, this is fruit that Holy Spirit bears everywhere He is, which of course He's everywhere. And when He's living in you, you're abiding in Him, you are going to bear this fruit because He's going to bear it through you, right? So love, joy, peace, and so on. However, in the same passage in Galatians 5, just a little bit farther up, a couple paragraphs up, We read a list of things that are not from the Lord, and the Lord is very clear about what they are. Michael, could you read this paragraph and this paragraph from Galatians 5? Okay, this starts at 16, right? Yes. Verse 16? Mm -hmm. All right, Galatians 5, 16, if you're following along, it says, I say then, and this is who talking? I believe that's the Apostle Paul. Okay, good. Uh, But it's the Holy Spirit (laughs) breathing the words through the Apostle Paul. Walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the lust... For the flesh lusts against the spirit, and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to the one to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish, but if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Next paragraph. Okay, pay attention, he's as he reads this. Now the works of the flesh are evident, which are, and then he lists them adultery, fornication, 
uncleanliness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, and revelries, and the like. I like how he just kind of like says, etc. Yeah. <laughs> of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the past time, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Okay. That's a pretty hard-hitting passage. That is hard-hitting. It's always hit me hard. Yeah. And I'm sure if we look at that, we can all say, Oh, God, have mercy on my soul. Because we're like, Oh, Lord, just yesterday I caught myself hating somebody. Oh, yeah. I mean, when I, when I say, Oh, well, if I could rate these, you know, I'd put murders pretty high up there. Adultery, that, that's bad. You know, but I'm going, Okay, wait. Um, outbursts of wrath. Uh-oh. Uh, is he saying that's the same as murders? Well, Jesus said... It's a work of the flesh. Yeah. And he also said if you... He said, you know, to commit murder, but what oh, if yeah. you have... Hatred what in if your you heart. you have hatred in your That's heart, right. then you've already committed murder in your heart. And you go, oh my. So, you know, if you're rating, ranking these as we lots of times want to do... Right. ...in, in our Christian culture, um, it's just as bad. So he lists all these... What about envy? Oh my goodness. So many people have envy. I mean, that's like... That's the sin you said nobody has, right? It's a joke. Yeah. Bob Sorge actually <laughs> says that. Envy is the biggest sin nobody has. Yeah. As a, as a joke. As in basically everybody struggles with this at some point. Yeah. So really, yeah, that's a great list. Yeah. And he, he says, and the like. So we have... Even more, we probably could add on. Right. And, and even contention, that's a pretty hard-hitting one, too. Well, here's the point. Um, where's my page nine? Whoop, missed a page. Well, anyway. Um, I'll look for it okay, you talk. Okay, Michael will look for page nine. Okay, so here's the thing. We can say, since we're examining situational fruit, we can say, okay, so-and-so, or, or this person I'm in relationship with, or this situation like a marriage or a, you know, whatever, a hostile work environment or a, a best friend that actually stabs you in the back all the time, or, you know, you could list any, any kind of situation here. Um, you can say, okay, I know what's from God, but I, I love this person, but yet I'm seeing fruit that is not from God. And sometimes it can be hard to admit it when something's not from God because we can love people and so we don't want to think anything bad about them. But the thing is you have to understand that you can disconnect your thoughts about a person from the thought about the fruit because the person we can still love, but Jesus said you'll know them by their fruit. And so the fruit, we say that is not from God. And people say, oh, well, don't judge because Jesus actually said, judge not that you be not judged. However, in another place, he said, judge with righteous judgment. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference? Well, the difference is judge not that you be not judged means I'm not going to, I'm not going to say, you can't be saved or someone can't be saved or that there's no hope for them or that God doesn't have every bit as much of a plan for their life, that he can't turn it around, change yeah. them. That's not up to me. But when he says judge with righteous judgment, that means we are absolutely to discern based on the word of God. As it says in Isaiah 8:20, to the law and to the testimony, if they speak not according to this word, it is because there is no light in them. And in the Old Testament also, the priests were charged with teaching the people the difference between the holy and the profane. Mm -hmm. The right. holy and the profane. Right. So we are absolutely supposed to examine fruit, and we are supposed to examine works. Mm. Um, and that doesn't mean you're judging a person's worth or not. Every human being was created in the image of God. Every human being, God died for them, even if they don't accept his salvation. God, Jesus still died for That's them. That's right. And he loves them. So, but we can still look at the fruit. So this is what you have to say. You have to say, okay, um, well, you know, I, they might be loving and kind sometimes, but is the spouse coming home and beating the stuffing out of you? Are they, but even, even something that's not so dramatic as that, because that's pretty obvious, I would hope. Absolutely. But let's look at things that are a little more subtle, but okay. just as evil. Sure. We can ask ourselves questions about a situation and we can say, is the person involved in this situation conceited? Are they all about themselves? 
How about provoking? Are they provoking me on purpose? Because in that passage, um, I, we didn't read it yet, but the, there's one last, oh, two sentences right at the end of Galatians 5 um, in that passage. It says, if we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Well, that provoking one another part, I mean, boy, it's pretty easy to provoke somebody. You know, sure. I mean, if you have a bad day at work, you come home, you want to kick the dog and snap at your spouse or whatever. I hope we don't do any of those things, but it's easy to think, oh, I can just get away with this, mm-hmm. you know, but actually if we ask ourselves about a situation, is someone conceited? Are they provoking me on purpose? Do they provoke other people on purpose? Do they envy? Are they jealous? Do they love one person less than another and one person more than another? Because the biblical definition of hatred is to love less. Go look it up in your Strong's Concordance. If you love one person less than another, you hate that person, biblically speaking. And that is hard to swallow, too. Because, I mean, it's so easy to have our favorites. And we can have favorites as far as, like, closeness of relationship. But if you line five people up and you're close with four of them and one of them you can't stand, you still have to sit there and say, I love you because you're my brother, my sister in Christ. And you have to love them every bit as much as the other four. So do they love one person less than another? If so, they're operating in hatred. Um, Do they seem to thrive on contention? Do they create contention even while they claim they want peace? Do they operate in selfish ambitions? Is it all about them? Do they live to serve other people or are they living to build themselves up, to build up their empire, to build up their status? You know, Solomon in the Bible had so much wisdom that God gave him. And yet despite that wisdom and even despite the fact that God said there'll never be another king like you Solomon lived his life to build himself up and he he took foreign wives got horses and chariots which they were forbidden to get Um, you know we made covenant with these idol worshiping wives he taxed the people terribly drove the country into um Uh, in in some ways into financial poverty while he made his own self wealthy and his army wealthy and his palaces wealthy and even the temple wealthy but he taxed the people he put them to work he he it, it was it was terrible he was not even though he had wisdom he did not rule in a godly way in many cases and so somebody can have wisdom they can be the nicest person sometimes but then other times you know, you have to say, are they, are they existing to build themselves up? Do they put their own needs, their own wants, their own desires before the desires and needs of other people? Yeah. Are they, if so, they're operating in what the Bible calls selfish ambitions, and that's a work of the flesh. And that really should be convicting to all of us because this is easy for all of us to come into, oh, to fall into. As, as I was studying this, I mean, I was like, God, have mercy on me. Get this stuff out of me. Mm-hmm. You know, because if there's anything in us and we see these scriptures, the scriptures are a mirror for ourselves, but we do have to still learn to apply them to others to get free. Right. And to other situations. Okay, so if you examine the fruit of a situation and you say, does this circumstance and this situation exhibit the fruit of the spirit or does it exhibit the works of the flesh? Then you start to begin to distinguish the fact that you are right with God there and you have personal fruit, hopefully, you distinguish that from this situation. Is it from God or is it not? Because if it's not, based on the scripture, we have a responsibility to obey God and get ourselves out of it. Mm -hmm. Now, this is probably for a part of a different chapter in the ebook, but I just want to mention it now. You know, Jesus said to love your neighbor as yourself. Now, Michael, just as an illustration, if you saw um, a family member or a great friend, you're, you're just walking down the road and there's a field, and in the middle of that field is your family member or your great friend, and they're just getting mugged, they're getting beaten, somebody's kicking them, they're on the ground getting punched, you're not going to just do nothing, are you? Absolutely not. So what are you going to do? Well, I'm a pretty peaceful guy, but in that kind of situation... Yeah, you'd n- probably never see me run so fast and, and take him out. Yeah. I, I would. I'd Absolutely. I'm sorry. Sorry. It's on camera. It's on video. But That's there fine. You go. <laughs> and, and why would you do that? 
because I love that person and because yeah. if they are the bride of Christ, then I'm going to protect them. Absolutely. And it's so important to people hear what you just said. He said, I would protect them because I love them. Okay. But here's the thing. Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. So why is it that when you would immediately, and and I say you, I just mean anybody, you would immediately come to the rescue of your wife, your husband, your child, your dog, you know, I mean, whatever, who is getting beaten up and attacked Mm -hmm. and whatever. Why then do we say, but I'm getting beaten up, I'm getting attacked, I'm getting mugged, I'm getting kicked, I'm getting falsely accused, abused, controlled, manipulated, and so on but I'm just going to let it happen. Right. Because it's, not, because it's not physical. Somehow we separate, I think, sometimes that. We see that going on and we say they're, phys- they're not physically being abused. They're not, maybe they're not even, you know, that they're, they're not my wife or they're not my child or whatever, so I'm going to take a step back and I'm not going to do anything about it. Yeah, but when it's, when it's um, ourselves, we, we, we tend to do exactly that. And we say, oh, I'll, sure. right? We sure. we say, oh, I, I can get through. Mm-hmm. You know, yep. I'll, I'll I'll make it. Push through, absolutely. But yet Jesus said, "Love your neighbor as yourself." Mm-hmm. Now you would never claim to be right with God if you don't love your neighbor, right? I mean, the Bible actually says, "If you don't love your neighbor, you don't love God. If you don't love your fellow man, I mean, it's that's a hard verse, but it's true. <laughs> it yeah. is. Um, we so want, we want to love God, but not not all people, right? You know, just the ones we like, <laughs> but. Actually, if Jesus is saying, love your neighbor as yourself, what comes first? Loving yourself Mm -hmm. comes first. Mm -hmm. And if you do not love yourself, you are disobeying the command of the Lord. And if you're disobeying the command of the Lord by not loving yourself, how on earth can you live a healthy life? You can't. You have to start by loving yourself in a godly way and admitting to God. See, if you don't love yourself, then you do not believe God's word because God's word says that he made you, that he formed you, that he has a call on your life. God's word says that no matter what happens to you, he's going to be with you. He says that he formed you on purpose and all of your days are written in his book when before any of them existed. He says that you are his masterpiece, that you are chosen and ordained. He changed, I mean, sorry, he he chose the moment of your birth. He threw you on. He, he took one sperm of, from your daddy out of billions, maybe, and th- took that one sperm and that one egg from your mother and put them together and threw your spirit on the womb of your mother for such a time as this. And you have the audacity to sit there and tell him that he did a bad job and you're not worth loving. Yeah, that'll preach. Uh I've used that, maybe not as graphically as that at times with, with people, but I've told them, I said, you know, why, why are you, you know, I'll hear my own family or someone I, I love dearly um, talk bad about themselves. And I'll say, you're not talking about my daughter, are you? And they're Good, talking I'm about glad their, you do they're, that. They're talking about themselves. Right. You're not talking about my wife, are you? Because that's not who God is. That's right, because they are masterpieces. And or a friend or anybody else. No, no, I mean, sure, we all want things different at times about ourselves. Sure. You know, we all have life kind of thrown at us. But, um, but yeah, I mean, we are created in his image and we are to respect and love ourselves. Right. And if we don't do that, we are not obeying the command of Jesus. Love your neighbor as yourself. And you cannot love yourself and you can't even claim to love yourself if you let yourself be abused you can't and all of us are growing and loving ourselves oh yeah it's you know, a journey <laughs> yeah I mean and from time to time the Lord will show us I know he does me like oh there's this certain area and the Lord will convict me and say hey you don't like that about yourself in fact you hate yourself in that area and it always shocks me when he does that because I'm like Lord you know I I've never conceived of that, never realized it, never given much thought to it. And he convicts me, you know, I'm like, okay. And then I have to turn that over to the Lord and be willing to love this masterpiece that he has created according to him. You know, I may not feel like a masterpiece and neither may you, but you are one. So anyway, okay. So after we start to love our neighbor as ourselves, that means we love ourselves. Then we have to become willing to protect and defend what the Lord tells us to protect and defend, yeah. even when it comes to ourselves. Not just the in the poor, the stranger, the widow, the orphan, yeah. but also ourselves. And um, so let's look also next at differentiating 
in a situation between that personal fruit and that situational fruit, okay? Just, just, just a couple more points because we've already kind of talked about it. But we're going to just uh, look at a couple more scriptures. Michael, could you read this Colossians 3.15 from the Amplified Classic version right there? Absolutely. So if you're following along, Colossians 3.15. And let the peace... Can you read the yeah. parentheses? Okay. Yeah. And let the peace, soul, harmony, which comes from Christ, rule, act as an umpire continually in your hearts, deciding and settling with finality all questions that arise in your minds in the peaceful state to which as members of Christ's one body you were also called to live and be thankful, appreciative, giving praise to God always. Thank you. Now, the Amplified just takes the Hebrew and Greek meanings of those words and sticks the definition right in the middle of the sentence. That's like why it's called Amplified. Peace, and then they put it in soul harmony. Right, yes. Okay. So when we're reading this, the reason I specifically quoted this from the Amplified Classic Version is because of this one phrase that very clearly in today's language explains this. Let the peace, soul harmony, which comes from Christ, rule, act as umpire continually in your hearts. Now, an umpire, say in the game of baseball, the umpire is going to be the one that's like, strike, you know, or ball, or, you know, safe. You know, they make calls, and it's very final. You know, like, bah! they're they're really all about their calls. Oh, yeah. You know, don't want to argue with those guys. Right. And they have their theatrics <laughs> that they go through. You know, they're very oh, yeah. certain. Oh, you yeah. know, they make all the, all the foot motions and body motions. They get really into it. Well, in the same way, peace is the umpire for you about your decision. Now again, you can't say it's just peace in general. You have to look at the difference between your personal peace and is a situation governed and ruled by peace, okay? But peace is an example of one thing that is an umpire, a decision maker, a deal breaker, if you will, in any situation. Now there's another one, um, actually, um, well, I won't say another one because there's actually the same principle applies with all the fruit of the Spirit. And I go into that more in the ebook, but I want to keep moving forward right here. But the way you examine a situation, if you look at any of the fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, and so on, you say, okay, I may have love in my heart, but is the situation I'm in filled with love? Is it governed by love? Is it characterized by love? I may have kindness in my heart. You may have kindness in your heart, but is the situation in which you are characterized by kindness are people consistently kind to you is kindness a value in this place is it a priority is it a defining mark of your situation of your relationship of your marriage i have a a, a reader who uh, sent me a message recently and someone who was a very close friend i wouldn't say best friend but but really close had just attacked them gone on this war path against them just attacking them and they hated to do it but over months and months of these attacks they finally decided okay this is not a healthy friendship and that was someone that they would have been very close to and they were asking me is this ungodly for me to call this out and say you know what i'm sorry but i need to cut off this relationship because of these continual attacks and lies and and this person even um asked me to to look at some some responses she thought about saying it and i was just like this is just the facts it's kind it's loving you know, it's not anything that's uh, inflammatory, but it's just healthy. And so, you know, you have to do that kind of thing. Is is this situation governed by kindness? Is it is kindness, love, joy? Is are these defining marks of the situation, um, and so on? So that's how you examine a situation. Now, also, let's look at. Um, let's see here. Let's look at what to do. Now, I, I, I'm teaching through this material, and I'm not sticking with chapter 1, 2, 3. We're not, we're, we've talked about things okay. from all the different chapters so yeah. far, because we're just kind of covering some highlights here. But years ago, um, I was in an abusive church situation, and I've talked about this a little bit before. I'm just going to talk about it again in case we have someone that hasn't heard. And... For a long time, I did not want to admit that there was anything wrong because I loved the people so much. And I'd also been brainwashed because the teaching in that situation that came from the leadership was, don't lift up your voice against the Lord's anointed. And the way that that was applied was, you are not allowed to even think 
or say anything that is not not only um, in agreement with the leadership, but in enthusiastic support of anything the leadership says. And so I really was beating myself up because I was reading my Bible, I was lifting up my eyes and looking at what was happening both to me and around me, and it did not line up. But yet I'd been so conditioned to just blindly support, blindly agree. And this went on for several years. And I was so um, just wrought up in my spirit with agony and torture over this because it was very deep in me that I was not supposed to lift up my voice against the Lord's anointed, which is a verse in the Bible, but it's very taken out of context in many situations today in Christian culture. Anyway, so um, eventually I got to the point where I, was, I just couldn't handle this agony in my spirit anymore. And I prayed this, I said, Lord, either you have to show me that I'm right in what I'm observing that doesn't match God's word, and you have to take away the pain that comes with noticing that I'm or that this situation, you know, take away the guilt so I don't even so I don't feel guilty for feeling this way, for noticing these things, or convict me and change my heart if I'm totally wrong, my attitude is wrong, my heart is wrong, if any of that is, is correct. I mean, if, if I'm wrong in any way, convict me and let me not even think that these things are wrong anymore. It's got to be one or the other. Right. It's kind of like when you, the situations you're going, I'm seeing all this going on. I, I, and then you look at somebody, and you're like, am I crazy? Am I, yeah. am I, am I, am I the only one seeing this? You know, and, yeah. it's, and it gets, you're kind of, kind of like saying, okay, God, if this is, I, then just take it away from me. I get yeah. it. You yeah. start to feel crazy. Yeah. Then after it's like, a while. okay, I get it. Then, you know, God, take this feeling away from me. If that's, if that's, if, if I'm just making this up, you know? Yeah. And that's how I was. And sure. so I prayed that. Sure. And immediately, I was, I remember, I was in great agony of spirit for several years. So this was a long process. Yeah. But in one moment, immediately, when as soon as I prayed that, I heard the voice of the Lord speak to me as clearly as I've ever heard him. He said one simple sentence, and this is what he said. You shall know the truth, and the truth will make you free. Mm -hmm. And as soon as he said that, I saw some things in a different way than I'd ever seen them before. So specifically, I saw that that was the moment in which for the first time I saw that the Lord always wants us to see truth. Not just the truth about how bad we are and how much we need to change, but the truth about everything, as we already talked about today. I also saw that it was, in fact, okay to notice the truth about situations. And I also saw, oh, okay, let me interrupt with a story about that. Okay. Um, a, a little while ago, it was, it was maybe a couple of years, I can't remember, but our sofa here in our office was filled with folks who were ex-staffers and ex-lay staffers from a church that was a mega church that had imploded and was imploding and since that time has imploded in a big way because of the pastor's moral failure, sexual, the pastor's sexual perversion, the manipulation and the control and a lot of the things that were happening in that church. That's right. And uh, they came to walk through some of our inner healing material about church wounds. Mm -hmm. One of the big things that they struggled with was that in, while they were still in the situation, watching the pastor have an affair with a secretary or somebody, watching the pastor kick his wife out of the church, watching the pastor continue to pursue the other woman before even without being divorced not that divorce was right either but you know just watching these things they were told by leadership in the church it's none of your business the pastor's living his best life leave it alone nothing to see here yeah <laughs> yeah and they were so tormented over that because people sure. they trusted in leadership were mm -hmm. telling them you shouldn't have a problem with any of this. Yeah. And so this is what we talk to them about. Jesus is the truth. You shall know the truth and the truth will make you free. You don't have to put on blinders just to protect so-and-so who's living his best life. And living his best life in this case meant fornicating, adultering, lying, cheating, stealing, manipulating, controlling, and the list goes on. I think I just read that list. I think you did read that list. Um, but anyway... So to get back to this point, it's okay to admit that what's, what's really happening is happening. Right. And it doesn't mean you love the person any less. Right. And I, I remember them sitting here, yeah. and it was like they had to actually 
speak it out. Like they had to realize that this was happening. And it was kind of like a few minutes ago when I mentioned, am I crazy? We have been noticing this, right? We're all together now. Can we talk about this? Is this something we still can't talk about? Is it taboo? I mean, it was like they had been almost uh, brainwashed into thinking that it was okay. Yeah. And we can't really talk about the problem. Yeah. We can't even bring it up. Yeah, we have to pretend that everything is okay. Sweep it under the rug. And let's let's just move along like nothing's going on. So that way we all keep our jobs and everything's yep. ha- fine and everybody keeps coming to this church. And, yeah, because some of these folks were paid staff. This is what they did for a right. living. But they knew it was wrong. Yeah. And they were willing to and to give up their livelihood to for the to, for be, it to be right. Yeah, absolutely. And and to say to, to look at a situation that's wrong and to say it's not wrong, to say it's right, to say it's okay, is lying. And we don't think of it that way because we have been brainwashed into saying that, you know what, somehow the leader's discernment is better than yours. The leader's opinion is more important than yours when actually we are all supposed to be accountable to one thing and one thing only, and that is the word of God. But yet somehow in Christian culture, we have allowed, we hear this in politics all the time, but it's not limited to politics. We have this thing called rules for thee, but not for me. (laughs) Right. You know? And people talk about that in politics, but we need to start talking about it in the church because when the leader lives one way, or when even in a marriage, when the sp- the husband or the wife lives one way, I got an email the, just like two days ago, I think, from a wife saying that they're in this marriage where the husband has two cars but will not allow the wife, who's like in her 70s, they're, they're somewhere in that age, they will not allow the wife to go anywhere or drive any vehicles. It's like, okay, rules for thee, but not for me. And it's wrong because we are all supposed to be accountable to the word of God. And we are all supposed to be able to keep one another accountable. In other words, your family and my family and all the families of Pastor Dan and Gunnar, you know, all of you that are watching on this video, we should all be able to sit down at a table and say, how are you doing? How's how's your life? How's your marriage? How's your children? You know, how how's your heart? Are you operating in purity and holiness? And we should be able to do that with who? With anybody? Anybody. Yeah. Because we're all accountable to the same standard, which is the word of God. Right. So um, in that t- moment when I saw that, or when Jesus told me, you should know the truth and the truth will make you free, I saw suddenly for the first time that if I acknowledged the truth, it would make me free. And what that meant was that acknowledging the truth would require me to act. And that's another concept lost to Christianity today. That knowledge of the truth demands action. But if you see the truth and do not act on it, you are then agreeing with the truth and you are, I'm sorry, you are agreeing with the falsehood and you are letting it into your life. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So, and if you let something evil in your life, if you align yourself with it and it's not from God, then that is an area in which you are not submitted to God. Now, this is pretty hard-hitting stuff. I hope we're all friends when this is over. But this is important because if we sit here and namby-pamby teach about your 10 ways to live your best life now, you are not going to get free. But I care enough about you to let you know I want you to be free because the Word of God says Jesus came to give you life and give it to you more abundantly and that the truth will make you free and that his whole job was to go about. Remember, it says in the book of Acts, see how the Lord anointed Jesus Christ of Nazareth with the Holy Ghost and power who went about doing good, healing all who were oppressed by the devil. And it also says that Jesus came to destroy the works of the devil. So if we suddenly say, this certain work of the devil is okay with me, we are no longer in submission to Jesus. That's right. All right. Are we still friends? I'm looking at the chat. Hey, everybody. We still friends? Okay. Friends. All right. So let's keep talking. We've already covered some of these things. Um, So I'm just kind of hitting some highlights here. Let's move on to the next step. Oh, this one, y'all. This one is really, 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 really deep. And I love you. 
And so as soon as I say the title of this chapter, somebody's religious hackles are going to go up on the back of your neck. But if you'll listen to the scriptures as I tell, as I explain what I'm saying, you're going to see something that you might have never seen before that most people probably we don't pay attention to. This was a huge revelation for me when the Lord showed me this. It's out of the book of Numbers of all places. Okay. I mean, we don't sure. usually when you sit down for your morning devotion. I mean, how many times do we just say, "Lord, I think I would like to read Leviticus. I think I would like to read Numbers. I think I want to read the Begats." You know? Hey, you know. Not all the time. You learn something. Yes, but this is out of the book of Numbers. Get this: the name of this chapter is "Don't Always Wait for the Voice." Now we we all we covered a little bit of this already, but I want to show you something that you might not have ever seen before. Okay. The Lord tells us in his word that there are some times when he gives us commands with great um, pomp and circumstance, if you will. Sure. There are some times when we get that angel appearance, mm-hmm. we get that earthquake, that trumpet blast, that still small voice even. Yeah, we all want to have God to say, appear in the burning bush and tell us exactly what we need to do. Absolutely. Right? Show up at our doorstep. Yes, and, say, and if Jamie, the angel, yes, yes send I, that we, angel Gabriel. We all want that, but it doesn't always happen. That it doesn't way, always does happen. Because sometimes, as we've already discussed, God simply expects us to read his word and obey it. To seek peace and pursue it. To depart from evil and do good and dwell forevermore. To depart from evil, period. And as I mentioned already, the older we get in the Lord, the more mature we get in the Lord, the more he expects us to simply know him and act like him. Okay, get this though. One of the things that he asks asks us to do is to become like Jesus, right? I mean, that's kind of the crux of the whole thing. Well, sure, yeah. That's, that's, mm-hmm. our, that's our goal. Mm-hmm. Now, Jesus only said what the Father said. And he only did what the Father did. And uh, those scriptures are in John chapter 5, John 12, 49. Let's just read those very quickly so they really do believe that this is in the Bible, okay? okay Could sure. you read these two passages? Sure, John 5, mm-hmm. starting at 19. 19 to 21. Okay, John chapter 5, verses 19. Then Jesus answered, who's he answering? By the way, I haven't read the context. Um, Probably just people. It's the crowd, a a crowd of crowd? people. Yeah. Okay. Then Jesus answered and said to them, Most assuredly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself. The Son as referring to himself. Okay. But what he sees the Father do. For whatever he does, the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he does, him, that him, excuse me, and shows him all things that he himself does. And he will show him greater works than these, that you may marvel. For as the Father raises the dead and gives life to them, even so the Son gives life to whom he will. Okay, thank you. And now John twelve forty nine, please. Okay, John twelve forty nine. For I have not spoken on my own authority, this is Jesus talking, but the Father who sent me gave me a command which I should say what what I should say and what I should speak. Amen. Thank you. Okay. So Jesus, notice, he only said what he heard the Father say. He only did what he saw the Father doing. But in Christianity today, sometimes we get those things crisscrossed. What we do sometimes is we say, I'm going to only do what I hear the Father say. But Jesus didn't say that. He didn't say that he only did things when Father said to do them. Of course, he did obey the Father when the Father said to do things. But he did not wait for Father to speak in order to mimic him. And a lot of what what the Lord expects us to do as we grow in Christ is mimicry. We are learning to mimic Jesus. Jesus. We are learning to mimic the Father because what Jesus did was mimicry. He didn't, he, if if the Father, for example, uh, yesterday you and Gunnar were sitting in here on the sofa and w- and Gunnar was just playing with you and when you would, would cross your legs one way, Gunnar would do the same thing. And when you moved yeah, your we were hand trying to have way, a serious conversation, but you know, that's difficult sometimes around Sometimes here. it is. But you know, and Gunnar would move his hand the same way when you did. Like right now, if I was trying to mimic the way you're holding your microphone, yeah, I would actually, do this. Yeah, we could yeah. turn. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, right. We're, okay. we're mimicking each exactly. other. Exactly. Yeah. Well, that's what 
our relationship with the Father is supposed to look like, but mm-hmm. we've forgotten that in many cases in the church. But if we learn how to mimic him, as we've already talked about, we don't always wait for his voice. We simply do what we see him do. And the Bible actually says, this is where the book of Numbers comes in. The Bible actually says that that is a form of command. Mm. And this is what it says. Um, Numbers 9, 15 to 23. Can I just read this? Because I might I might interrupt myself every yeah, couple yeah, words here. Go for it. Okay, so Numbers, Numbers 9, 9, 15 to 23 describes a um, it describes how the Israelites acted when they were in the wilderness when they were obeying God okay so this is a description of godly actions here and this is what it says now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up the cloud covered the tabernacle just just a little disclaimer here that cloud is literally the chariot of the pre-incarnate christ it's also seen in the book of ezekiel it's seen in the psalms it's seen in multiple places we have a whole study on the chariot of the pre-incarnate christ and it's called um understanding the prophetic whirlwind if you haven't right. got that it's like what six hours of teaching or something it's Four a lot hours? yeah five and a half something like that yeah. yeah it's deep and it's awesome you need to get that okay but just so you know just understand that 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 when we're talking about that cloud it is literally the cloud that was the chariot of christ and jesus himself pre-incarnate jesus was inside the cloud with them physically in in manifest presence okay so here we go Uh, now on the day that the tabernacle was raised up the cloud covered the tabernacle the tent of the testimony from evening until morning it was above the tabernacle like the appearance of fire so it was always the cloud covered it by day and the appearance of fire by night whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle After that, the children of Israel would journey. And in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. Notice it doesn't say, they followed the chariot, they followed the cloud until the voice of God boomed out with seven trumpet blasts and said, we shall stop here. Right? Right. They just hop themselves up. They pack up their tents, their livestock, their children, their wives, and they just hippity hoppity along the bunny trail, if you will. the cloud, let's go. That's right. That's what they were doing. (laughs) So anyway, okay, so whenever the cloud was taken up from above the tabernacle, after that, the children of Israel would journey. And in the place where the cloud settled, there the children of Israel would pitch their tents. At the command of the Lord, the children of Israel would journey. And at the command of the Lord, they would camp. As long as the cloud stayed above the tabernacle, they remained encamped. Now you saw right there the first time, twice in that sentence, at the command of the Lord. Remember that. Next. Even when the cloud continued long, many days above the tabernacle, the children of Israel kept the charge of the Lord and did not journey. So it was when the cloud was above the tabernacle a few days. According to the command of the Lord, they would remain encamped. And according to the command of the Lord, they would journey. So it was when the cloud remained only from evening until morning. When the cloud was taken up in the morning, then they would journey. Whether by day or by night, whenever the cloud was taken up, they would journey. Hey, what happened when the cloud was taken up? They would journey. They would journey. Whether it was two days, a month, or a year that the cloud remained above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would remain encamped and not journey. But when it was taken up, they would journey. At the command of the Lord, they remained encamped, and at the command of the Lord, they journeyed. They kept the charge of the Lord at the command of the Lord by the hand of Moses. There you go. That is deep because... This passage clearly shows what we've been talking about, that the obedience that they exhibited in the wilderness by following the cloud was mimicry, not obeying a verbal command. It was at the command of the Lord. And what did that command look like? It looked like, there's the cloud. Hey, there it goes. Cloud goes up. Insert robot sounds here, you know. There it goes. And the Israelites, here we go. Yep. And off they would go. Right. But it was not a verbal command because God, if you recall this, God actually tried to speak with them before the Mosaic law was ever given. He gathered them at the base of Mount Sinai. He said, don't come any closer, but I'm going to speak to you. There were supernatural trumpet blasts. If you read it, it wasn't just like priests standing there blowing some trumpets. It was a supernatural manifestation. There was this firestorm and God began to speak to the people personally. And the people said, We're scared. Don't talk to us. Moses, just have God tell you whatever and give us a list of things to do and we'll do it. 
they did not they actually rejected personal relationship with God he wanted to speak to them one on one but they said no so then they got the Mosaic law because that's what they wanted that's right but here he was still telling them what to do Mm -hmm. it's just that he did it by showing them Mm -hmm. so mimicry is still at the command of the Lord but the Lord speaks in different ways sometimes it is that trumpet trumpet blast that angel appearance that earthquake that still small voice even other times it's the father sitting here like this he's looking at us over his glasses and he looks at our situation and looks at your Bible and he's like "Uh, you already saw what I did you already saw what I do mimic me Jamie, I need a word. I need a word. I need a word. I need a word. And then we say, well, there's a bunch of words right there. 1,200 pages of word right here. Have you ever picked up the Bible? Because (laughs) you'll learn a whole lot of word in that Bible of people who have gone before you and have made the mistake you may be about to make. Yeah. And it's right there. Learn from their mistakes. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned that also because, you know, the Bible says that the Word of God is alive and powerful. Um, Some versions say quick, but that doesn't mean fast. Quick is a gardening term. That means like when you peel back a stick and it's still alive, it'll be green on the inside, um, which is translated alive. The Word of God is alive and powerful and is sharper than a two-edged sword, piercing to the dividing line of soul and spirit and joints and marrow. And that's helpful when we're emotionally involved in a situation because we're like, hey, I don't know if I'm going to do this or not. I don't. I feel a certain way, whatever. We have to have the Word of God pierce between the things that are soulish. Soul is your body, your, your I'm sorry, your mind, will, and emotion. So all that right. emotional stuff is soulish. Doesn't mean it's bad, it's just soul. Mm-hmm. So the Word of God pierces between and divides the emotion, the soul, away from what is spirit. And that's the only way that we can get that word. So let the Lord do that so we can hear clearly. All right. So next step is, after you've understood, you don't always have to wait for the voice. You have to look and see, how is God speaking in this situation? What is he asking you to do? Is he speaking through just waiting for you to obey, not just waiting for that trumpet blast, not still a small voice? Next step, act and free yourself from your chains. Okay? Act and free yourself from your chains. Now there's a scripture that says, and I don't, I don't know if I this got in the book or if it's just coming to my mind right now. Um, but there is a scripture that says, I believe it's the Apostle Paul wrote, but he said, "If possible, as much as depends on you, live peaceably with all men." Okay. Isn't that interesting that he said that? As much as it depends on you, because when you're in a situation where you're experiencing, what are these things, Michael? Abuse, control, manipulation, accusations. When you're caught in that labyrinth, that evil maze. Right. Sometimes the whole part about as much as it depends on you, you're going to try as much as it depends on you to live peaceably or even to separate yourself peaceably, Mm -hmm. but it's not going to work for you. And I'm sorry, but here's the thing. If, If that bridge is burned when you escape that situation, they were never your friend. They might have been abusing you and so on. They might have been using you. They might have been insert any number of verbs, but they were not your friend. Mm-hmm. Because if, if, we're, if we're in any kind of friendship, any of you, then you can say, hey, this is wrong according to Matthew 18, and let's fix this. And the other person will be broken, and they'll say, I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry I did that. Please forgive me. You know, whether they meant to do it or didn't mean to do it. You know, there's that mutual relationship there. But when you're in a situation that is the labyrinth, you're not wrestling with people. You're not wrestling against flesh and blood. It's what? It's principalities and powers and rulers of this present darkness. That's right. And you know what? Newsflash, guys. I know you already know this, but hear hear me when I say, the devil hates you. And the devil is not suddenly going to start liking you. And the thing that is in that person who is abusing you, misusing you, and so on, is not that person. It's the devil. They are submitted in some way. They have let an open wound, an open door. They have let the influence of the enemy in. That is the enemy hating on you through them. And it ain't going to change until they... The only way it's going to change is if that person repents and closes the door to the enemy so the enemy can no longer flow through them. That's right. 
And you are not the agent of their repentance. Holy Spirit is the only one that can convict them. Okay? That's why it says in the book of Job, it talks about the Leviathan, which is a whole different study. We have that. We did that study, uh, I don't know, a few months ago. Um, Leviathan is the demonic principality that twists things. And God actually taught Job about Leviathan and said, if you touch him, you won't do it again. In other words, <laughs> if, you, if you try messing with him, you're going to learn that it's better just to stay away. Yeah. Here's the thing. If possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. So when you decide that you're going to obey God, you're going to act, you're going to free yourself from your chains, you're going to do that honorably, you're going to do that graciously and kindly with love and with the fruit of the Spirit. But you're not going to let yourself keep getting beat up because that wouldn't be submission to Jesus. So you can transition away from things. You can separate yourself from relationships and situations, even in marriage. And I put this in the book. If you're in a situation where your husband is cheating on you, your wife is cheating on you, your spouse is beating you, whatever it is, get away from that situation, especially if it's abuse. Get to a safe place. And if you want to work on things, do it from a safe place. Please don't be a statistic. Okay, you can go to counseling from a safe place. You don't have to be in a place where you're going to get injured. Okay, but do your best as much as it depends on you to live peaceably. But you still have to get out. And I have a lot of scriptures here to encourage and equip you in that. I'm not going to go into all of them, but just be aware. And here's another situation. I actually mentioned this in the book those people we talked about yeah. that were from that church that imploded. That's right. Um, one of the things that, one of the big questions they had was how can all of these things be wrong and how can this man not be operating in a godly situation or in a, in a godly way when people still get saved in church services? Yeah, that's, that is a, a big, as a question we see, we, we see people fall, and we see people yeah. fall in their ministry, we see things happen, and we go, but, but I, maybe you even came to the Lord and yeah. under that ministry, or, yeah. you know, and you go, how can this happen? Yeah, there was a very famous situation um, out in, in Colorado Springs a number of years ago. There's been a, a very infamous, unfortunately, situation up in Chicago, I and mean, we could just name so oh, many. Yeah, so many. Um, and here's, here's the explanation for that, and it's very simple. Jesus said in John 12, 32, And I, if I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Yeah. And that is both literal and metaphorical. He was lifted up on the cross and now draws all men to himself. But also, if you magnify the name of Jesus by preaching his word, God will always honor his word. It can be preached from the most corrupt lips on the planet. God will still see people get saved, healed, and delivered when his word is preached. God in the book of Acts um, was, you know, he was building the early church. And it says that the apostles preached the word and the Lord worked with them, confirming the word in signs and wonders. So you're like, well, how can, how can this be a bad situation? Um, my, you might say, and I've actually had some, some ladies reach out to me about this that are pastor's wives. Um, at various churches, first ladies. And they'll say, my husband will preach the most anointed service, or the most anointed sermon, but he'll come home and beat me. He'll come home and manipulate me. Come home and, you know, whatever. And insert verb here, you know. Yeah. Why is that? How can that happen? It is not because of the purity of the vessel. Remember what the Apostle Paul wrote in Philippians chapter 1. He was in prison, okay? Philippians 1, 15 to 18. He said, some indeed preach Christ even from envy and strife and some also from goodwill. The former preach Christ from selfish ambition, not sincerely, supposing to add affliction to my chains, but the latter out of love, knowing that I am appointed for the defense of the gospel. What then? Only that in every way, whether in pretense or in truth, Christ is preached, and in this I rejoice, yes, and will rejoice. So he had been preaching. Some people hated him, and they wanted to make him more miserable in prison because he couldn't preach, and they just wanted to be like, nee, 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 nee. I can preach and you can't. And so they went and preached, but God honored it. And then other people said, Paul, you're in prison, you can't preach. 
we love you so much and we just want the name of Jesus to be magnified so we're not preachers I've never preached a sermon in my life but I'm going to go and I'm going to preach Christ because you can't well God honored that too yeah so we have to understand that God's word stands alone the grass withers and the flower fades but the word of God abides forever and the word of God is living and powerful and the word of God as it says again in the Psalms I've magnified my word above my name is what God says I've magnified my word above my name so when the word is preached it's always going to bring results and the people who I mean I don't know about you Jamie but I haven't reached perfection yet um, I haven't either for so, sure so uh, <laughs> ask anybody that knows me so I could be standing here today and talking to you yeah. on the other side of that lens here and pour out my heart, tell you all about Jesus, walk away from here and get on the road and have a moment of wrath in my heart from somebody cutting me off on the interstate. And honk and, your horn. And I just immediately yeah. sinned or whatever. And I, oh my goodness, what just happened? Yeah. Well, that's why I always say, Guys, pray for your leaders. Pray for people who are in the public eye. Pray for those because, boy, when we lift them up on a pedestal really yeah. high, yeah. they fall really hard. And um, We're not so, supposed to lift men up on a pedestal. Yeah, you're right. Well, no, but we see it all yeah. the time. We, we, I'm just using an example. No, I agree with yeah, you. Yeah. They fall really hard, yeah. and, and many, many people suffer for, uh, because of it. So pray for those. Pray for those people. Yeah. And... Um, all right, so I hope that answers a few questions. Now, after that, there's some more stuff. Um, you're supposed to, number one, shake the dust off your feet when you, trans when you remove yourself from an abusive situation, okay? Um, just, I'll go into this briefly, Matthew 10, 11 to 15. Michael, could you read this passage that Jesus uh, was teaching on, Matthew 10? Yeah, absolutely, Matthew 10. Matthew 10, starting in verse 11. Yep. It says, Now, whatever city or town you enter, and he's talking to the disciples. Yep. I've read this recently. Inquire who in it is worthy, and stay there till you go out. And when you go into a household, greet it. If the household is worthy, let your peace come upon it. But if it's not worthy, let your peace return to you. Keep going? Yes, please. Okay. And whoever will not receive nor hear your words, when you depart from that house or city, shake off the dust from your feet. Assuredly, I say to you, it will be more tolerable for the land of Sodom and Gomorrah, referring back to the Old Testament, in the day of judgment than for that city. Okay. So here we have Jesus exhibiting some boundaries and teaching his disciples to have some boundaries as well. And we, again, we do have a class about boundaries that I taught several months ago because this is another topic in the body of Christ where we're taught namby-pamby Christianity and it doesn't line up with the Word because God's Word says you should have boundaries and you should enforce them. And so here's Jesus saying, when you go in um, into a new place, hey, if they'll receive you, that's great. Let them benefit from your presence. But if they won't receive you, they won't listen to you, shake the dust off your feet when you have to leave a situation where you've been rejected and so on you need to shake the dust off your feet and i mean that very literally okay i don't mean just like okay god i've moved on no i mean go and and sit down in a place where you can wave your feet in the air or scrape your shoes against a curb and scrape the dust even if there's no dust you might be wearing the whitest of all white shoes and there's no dust on them and they're pristine I don't care sit down and shake the dust off your feet scrape the dust off your feet why why did Jesus teach that because when you transition from one place to another not only do you need to have a dividing line between okay that was the past and this is the future remember Paul said one thing I do I forget what lies behind and I press on towards what lies ahead but also you need to be able to say to yourself and shaking the dust off your feet and empowers you to say it I am valuable I am a child of God I did not deserve this what happened to me was wrong I'm leaving it and I'm moving on and the action of shaking the dust off your feet actually causes you to realize that you have a backbone and you are worth defending 
It does. I have a whole chapter about this and more about it, but um, I'm going to leave that for the ebook. It's an important, important, important concept. After that, what's going to happen? What does your future look like? Because you're, you're shaking the dust off your feet. That's the line in the sand between the past and the future, that, which is now your present. Well, number one, I can tell you, you are going to receive and start to flow in anointings and giftings and levels of power, the power of God that you have not flown, flowed in maybe for a long time, if ever. Because when you're in those situations, when you're being... You're experiencing what are these things again, Michael, in the labyrinth? Abuse, mm-hmm. control, manipulation, accusations. Yeah. When you're in those situations, it's almost like we, uh, we become like turtles or shellfish, and we do this. And we're just trying to survive another day. We're just trying to get through. We don't have emotional space to flow in joy like we're supposed to. We don't have a mental and emotional headspace that we need. We, we, we start to guard and protect because that's the only way we can live through it. But when suddenly nothing around you hurts and you forgive, that's important too, when you forgive those people and all that, suddenly from a place of peace, peace is the potting soil of revelation. From a place of rest, rest is the potting soil of revelation and joy and creativity. And when I have had to leave situations that were that labyrinth, when I've had to escape those situations, I will tell you, I've had results like seeing the prophetic flow, seeing the flow of creativity, seeing a level of awareness of God's love and manifest presence flood in like I had not experienced in years since I started to be under those situations. Friend, if you leave that situation, suddenly you're going to experience what it says in Psalm 68. And I'm going to open this, uh, my Bible right here, and read this to you again. Psalm chapter 68. Psalm 68. Verse 6, God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity, but the rebellious dwell in a dry land. When God brings you out and you follow him by obeying him, mimicking him, doing whatever his word says to do, he brings you out into prosperity. He does not bring you out into a desert, a dry place. But he brings you out into a place of health, healing, wholeness, creative flow, prophetic anointing, and all the awareness of his presence, the fruit of the Spirit, the blessing. But you could not receive those blessings because it really very literally does flow from the head. If there's something above you, whether it's a a job or an abusive marriage or whatever it is that God is telling you to leave, that thing is dominating your life But God's blessing is supposed to dominate your life. But as long as you're submitting to another thing that's not from the Lord, it's like you're putting a gate above your head because you're not aligned with what the Word of God says. But as soon as you stand up and say, I'm going to obey this Word, even if it's not with a still small voice, even if it's just, I read and therefore I obey, The level of blessing is off the charts. Psalm 68, God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. But the rebellious dwell in a dry land. And see, that's that third, that third line is what I was just talking about. When there's that, it's like you put that gate over your head. Because as we already discussed, if we are not loving ourselves and not pursuing that peace and not doing all these things to enforce and cr- our own boundaries and stick up only for what's godly, then we are being rebellious, even though it's, it, we not, might not ever have realized it. We might not ever have intended to be rebellious. We might certainly have said, I will never be rebellious on purpose. But with knowledge comes responsibility. And as soon as you decide you're not going to be that rebellious person dwelling in a dry land, God sets the solitary in families. He brings out those who are bound into prosperity. You have anything 
to add there, Michael. I think I'm done. I, that's not everything from the ebook, but I think that's kind of covers what I want to cover today. No, and that's great. And and uh, the the ebook uh, that we're releasing on Monday will cover everything that we just covered and a lot more and a lot more. So you'll have. Um, how many chapters is that total on the? Table? It's seven oh, chapters seven plus seven an chapters. introduction. Okay, yeah. that's right. Seven steps. Correct. Yeah. So, um, if you want to, basically, the a guide to walking through this as we laid out today, uh, I would advise you to order that. They can order the ebook, the pre-order. Are we? Have no. we already released it? No, it's starting okay. on Monday. Okay, starting mm -hmm. on Monday. All right. Yeah. So this coming Monday on our store and uh i think we have probably the 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 link is on our um uh, on there right now the yeah in the comments it shows tap yeah. bio at jamie Rohrbaugh. that's our link right and when you see that you can swipe left and right and and you'll see various things whether it's video whether it's a new article we've released or an upcoming uh product yeah you'll yeah see the book it'll actually be it looks like a maze You'll see that but it won't be in black and white. Yeah, and the maze is blowing up over here. It's this bright <laughs> orange and green. And yeah. may I also say, if this is hitting home with you, but you're scared and there's trepidation in your heart, you need to sow a seed. I encourage you to do that. I encourage you to sow into this word and say, Jesus, help this, root, this word take root in my heart. Give me the courage and the boldness to obey. Help me to study these things out because you need to be like the Bereans. Don't just sit here because I'm saying it. You need to get your Bible. Get this book if it'll help you know which scriptures to study. Get your Bible and read it for yourself. Absolutely. Don't ever just take something that I say or Michael says or any preacher, pastor, neighbor, friend, husband, wife, child. Don't ever take that for gospel until you read it in the book. Right. But I encourage you to sow a seed into this word. If this is hitting home with you and you say, I know I need this freedom. I need to be the one that God brings out into prosperity. Yeah. And no longer the rebellious who dwell in a dry land. And please hear me when I say, I'm not accusing anybody of rebellion. I'm just saying, these are things that we, we're not, you know, the Bible says that without knowledge, no sin is imparted. Right. And so when we don't know these things... There's no responsibility to act on them because we don't have a clue what we're supposed to act on. But as soon as we study the scriptures and the Lord shows us things, then we are responsible to act. Yeah. And so if you say, God, I, I need your help doing this, but I'm willing to chase this. I'm willing to obey your scriptures and walk out into prosperity with you. I encourage you to sow a seed. You can do that. And the seed, what happens? The seed, the seed connects your faith to the word. The seed gives you skin in the game, if you will. Shoe leather on the ground that says, God, I am grabbing onto this for myself. It's not magic. It's just seed sowing costs you something. David said, I won't offer to the Lord that which costs me nothing. So it engages you, okay? So if you want to sow a seed, you can click on the tap bio, the link there that Gunnar has put in our chat. And you can uh, find our giving links there as well, and you can sow that seed. Michael, do you have any other announcements that we want to share real, very briefly? Um, I can't think of anything exactly except for obviously the, the sowing of the seed that will help this ministry produce things like this as well as yeah. the book that's being released this Monday. Yeah. Um, I know we're doing a pre-order of another book oh. that was just released. Yep. Well, the book's not released yesterday. It's a print book. Paperback, yeah. Yes, a paperback book. We had released an ebook version of it, but now we have a print book. Now, yep. does the print have more? Uh, or is it, it the same? It's virtually the same. I always change a word or two, but it's not significantly different. That is it's just a better cover. More days. Twenty-one more days of breakthrough prayer. Yeah. To the popular hit, twenty-one days. Right, companion <laughs> to twenty-one days of breakthrough prayer. Yeah. yeah. So we have we have uh, now another book about twenty-one more days, and that is in production right now. Uh, two or three weeks from now, you'll see that on the store as well when you're on there. Well, we released it yesterday. Yeah, you can look on there and you can go ahead and order it. And again, it won't ship today because it's not ready. Um, but when, as soon as it is ready, we'll send it on out the door. Yeah. Um, for those that are looking for, you know, we've, at least in the Chattanooga, Tennessee area, it it's like we have the four seasons uh, pretty much uh, in a week. 
here it may be warm 70 degrees in in the winter and then it drops down to then the 20s you know we never know but for those that are in a colder climate i know the uh, uh, the uh, northeast has been really hit hard with some cold if you're up there and you're like you know i'd really like to wear a comfortable hoodie in in this we cold have weather some. we have some left <gasps> They're and so pretty. Just yesterday, Dan and I in the ministry here, we went through and, and got an inventory of what we have left. And uh, I'm dodging hoodies. And so uh, we've got a gray and a pink. And the pink's kind of that desert pink color. Yeah. Um, but it's really nice. And guys, uh, if you need that, it's it's a nice brand. Let's see how well I do with this. All Can right. I just say, I designed this personally. <laughs> we did not just have this manufactured. I personally made this for you. Only can get it from this ministry. Yeah. And... Um, and all the words are chosen personally by me to describe you. And what are words is that? Let's see. Favored, chosen, cherished, uh, royal, clean, pure, beloved, anointed, child of God, elect, protected, ordained, and so on. Get a hoodie. Yeah. Don't look good in pink, Jamie? Uh, you know, I think dudes should be comfortable yeah. wearing pink. Yeah, pink is always a good color. Yeah. It's kind of a deserty, rugged wing. Yeah, you yeah. can p find a picture of it in the tap dot bio. When you yeah. click on that, you'll see a lady wearing that, actually wearing this color right here. Get so your hoodie. Take you straight to order that, and you just pick your size: a medium, large, extra large. Some of them have sold out, but we'll just package it up, send it your way. Yeah. All right, I'm going to pray over you right now, and let's just go to the Lord, Father, in Jesus' name. If we said anything that was not from you during this broadcast, I ask that that word, that anything that was not from you would just be broken right now. I break it and let it fall to the ground, useless and of no effect. But Father, everything we said that was from you, and hopefully that was everything, but everything that was from you, God, let it be seared into our hearts like a brand, God. Let there be smoke in our hearts as your word forever changes the landscape of our hearts. And we thank you, Father. Help us. Give us boldness to act. Boldness. Give us ears to hear and eyes to see. A nose to smell your fragrance. Teach us to mimic you, even when your command is by action rather than a voice. God, let us love you and obey you. And I pray for every person who's bound in anything, Father, that they would arise, that they would awake, that they would shake themselves from the dust, that they would get up, that they would leave that situation that is abusive to them. Father, that is unholy in whatever way, I ask you to give them wisdom. I ask you to give them and show them the way out. And Lord, I ask you to set them free because, Lord, your word says, uh, he whom the Son sets free is free indeed. We thank you, Jesus. And Lord, we just uh, bless our friends. We plead the blood of Jesus over our mind, will, and emotions, body, soul, and spirit. We plead the blood of Jesus over this word. And we thank you and give you all the praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Thanks so much for tuning in today, friend. Thanks for listening. And check out the book Labyrinth and How to Escape It on Monday. All right. Have a great day. Yeah. Have a great weekend. See you later. Bye-bye.